my name's Jack. I work in West Lothian Council and for a long time I was our service designer, so I'm just going to reflect on some of the work we did there. Joe's sharing my slides for me, so you will hear me go next slide, please, Joe. And that was a cue, if you can. Perfect. So this was a project um, to look at how we used cash across all of social work um, and I will refer to it as social policy because it's wider than just practice social work as we would call it. Our service is called social policy and that's both traditional social work but also care, justice services, all that kind of piece that will impact someone's life. So on the back of the pandemic we knew that the service wasn't set up correctly for our customers um, and we wanted to really do that deep dive to understand what were we getting right and what were we getting wrong so building on what we already had what we'd learned from the pandemic and take it forward so the three things we really want you to do first and foremost was maintain our client safety um, we knew that the structure we had and and the way that the service was set up probably hadn't done that to the best of its ability in in COVID um, our our old service as it was forced our clients to come into one of two offices to collect cash in person. Um, even just saying that out loud, you can you can probably understand many of the issues with that setup. It's, it's not something people particularly want to do. Um, we wanted to understand and improve our customer journey and we wanted to look at our internal processes as well to see where they were holding up or causing barriers within that process. Next slide, please, Joe. So of course um, we wanted to take a service design approach. We first wanted to understand what were we getting wrong before we started fixing problems because what we've traditionally done as a council is jump straight to that we think we know what the problem is. Let's start putting some solutions in place and hope that they work. We really wanted to do this differently and understand what wasn't right, make sure we were solving the right problems and then really in taking that service design approach, put the right solutions in place. So next slide, please. What we discovered quite quickly was that payments was a bit wider than just making payments. There was different people involved in receiving those payments and we were able to split that out into three main client groups. So we had something called section payments, which if you're not familiar with them, those tend to be emergency payments, um, but can also be payments for things like contact with a child. Um, so different scenarios in there, some would get a section payment, but that's pretty much what they are. Our corporate appointees, those are clients or service users who we have um, put in a application to the DWP to almost take control of their finances because they're not coping or not managing them on their own and they are at risk of causing harm to themselves. And then our through care aftercare clients are those clients 16, let me get this right, I think it's up to 26 years old, but they will receive payments between 16 and 18 to bridge that gap between leaving care um, whilst they're in further education. Next slide, please. So we started from a point of user research. We wanted to understand our customers who actually was using uh, or were using these services. Um, and that led us to our three main client groups that we wanted to improve things for. But that also made us realise quite quickly that we can't just broad brush. Like Barbara was saying earlier, we have three client groups. Within those client groups, there are a number of different reasons why someone's going to use these services. So that started from speaking to people and doing some quick user interviews at that point of contact with the service. So actually going and standing in our cash offices, going to where our customers were and not expecting them to come to us, something we are guilty of as an organisation, and I suspect many of your organisations may be as well, is we put surveys out there and expect people to, to be open and honest and tell us what they think. And then we don't report back to those people and tell them what we actually did with the information they provided. So catching people at that point of use of the service meant they were in that frame of mind of this is the experience I'm currently having and were able to take a couple of minutes out of the day, five, ten minutes, maybe even a minute with some people depending on how much time they had available. 
We also did some observations. So we would sit behind the cash desk, see how that interaction took place. That let us really see firsthand some of the frustrations some of our customers had, some of the things that were that were triggering them in using that service, um, especially for our corporate appointees, because in a lot of cases they have been told that they need to be on a corporate appointeeship and not always volunteered to be on that appointeeship. Um, and where it was appropriate, we started involving people in our project groups. Now, given the the needs of these clients, it wasn't always the best place for those clients to be involved in the group themselves. But for us to have those conversations and bring either their social workers into the conversation or their advocates into the conversation where they weren't able to take part on their own, but still making sure that that voice was heard as best as it could be. Next slide, please. So like I've just spoken through, we spent time in our, our local offices, we spoke to customers, their carers, their representatives, but also the social workers involved in the, the assessment and review of their care um, to make sure we understand not only what the, our clients need from this service, but also our social workers are a key stakeholder here as well. They need to be empowered to provide this service in the best way they can and also our administrative and customer service staff to understand what's working well for you and, and what really isn't. Next slide, please, Joe. So that resulted in a user research report um, really outlining the issues as they stand, and I'll cover some of those issues and then what we've done to fix them in the next few slides. So if you could move us on, please. So I'll start with our customers who used section payments. And the first thing that we found was that a lot of time was wasted by council staff traveling to offices to collect payments on a client's behalf. So the view was always that the clients will come to us to collect payments. But what that actually resulted in a lot of time was our social workers going and collecting payments and hand delivering them to clients. And that was taking up a lot of social workers time to do that, but also our support workers time in our, our third sector or, um, and our kind of commissioned care who were taking up valuable care hours to travel into our offices to then collect someone's money for them and take it back to them in their community. That traveling to an office was really inconvenient for clients. Obviously in the pandemic that wasn't exactly safe and that's when we've seen a lot of staff collecting payments on clients behalf. Um, but it also meant that as a council, we were having to meet that cost of travel. So if we were giving someone a, a £20 emergency payment to say, um, meet the cost of their electricity over the weekend, that would maybe be more like £30 or £40 nowadays, given the cost of living. But if we were giving someone that payment, we were then paying an extra £6, £7, eight pounds for them to travel in on us on a bus. And that's not something the client particularly wanted to do either. They just wanted access to, to their money to get their electricity up and running. They didn't want to take 20 minutes to travel into Bathgate, collect their cash and return to Fault House or wherever it is they live. Um, they also had the ability to apply for and receive payments from both social work in the form of a, a um, section payment where there was immediate risk to that family or um, it was more cost effective for us as a council to meet that risk, but also um, for the Scottish Welfare Fund and claim a, an emergency payment, they could do that both at the same time, which for some of our most vulnerable clients would mean they would get two payments independently of each other from the council. And that would result in them causing harm to themselves and representing themselves to social work the next day after having taken that. So if you move us on, Joe. I'll talk a little bit about what we did for this client group. So we introduced PayPoint. Um, we realised we needed to stop people coming into an office where that wasn't the best approach for them. Um, and that lets us send payments directly to either a client's phone, their advocate's phone, but also we can specify whether they've to receive that as cash or whether that's to be an energy voucher. So preventing someone using that for the wrong purposes if we think there's a risk there. Um, we also started to, and it's still ongoing in terms of its review, of putting a framework in place, in place for giving people options for how they receive their payments. So traditionally it's always been a, we provide payments out of two cash offices, you will come collect that payment from us. Now that's not 
not how someone wants to receive a payment. We know that a lot of people don't want to interact with social work and especially don't want to be seen interacting with social work. So moving away from that and giving people choice over if it's best for you, you can still come collect payments from a cash office. That's totally fine. But there are these other options available for you. Obviously, there's the audit side of things, making sure that as we change things for the workers, um, moving away from paper based forms to online forms, letting them have that agency over um, what they were asking for and taking away the need for physical signatures to be put in place was something social workers found really time consuming as well. Um, making sure that all that audit trail was there for us. And again, Social Work and Scottish Welfare Fund processes, they're still in the process of being reviewed because it's two separate services that deliver that. Um, but they're now on the same system and we're hoping to get to a place where actually it's one process applying for emergency funds from the council instead of it being multiple different channels into different funds, as it were, um, to meet that same need. Next slide, please, Joe. So moving on to our corporate appointees, um, and there's a number of reasons someone can have an appointeeship, and we developed personas as we were going through the project to, to really keep those users at the heart of what we were trying to do. So that could be anything from someone having dementia with no family, where they need the council to support them with um, making sure they're paying their bills on time and making sure they've got enough money to get their shopping and they're supported to do so to someone who has issues with addiction who um if given access to all their money they will they will spend it all within a day and need to present to social work straight away so again travel was high for for clients and support workers there was a range of ability through that client group so those two cases that i just mentioned have completely different ability in their in their ability to understand and use their cash. So again, making sure that the right thing was available for the right person was really important. Um, there was no clear route when we went in and lifted the hood on actually for someone to show that they're able to, to regain their financial capability. So someone who has a, a, um, a case of dementia, that's unlikely to get any better. But someone who has had issues with addiction, they, they will recover from that over time, likely. So they need to be able to, um, or one of the frustrations that was coming from, from our clients really was, there's no way for me to show that I can manage my money any better. Um, and of course, the obvious thing here was concerned around ability to spend cash during the pandemic. A lot of, a lot of our corporate appointee clients have never had a bank account. So were forced to use cash because that was the medium that we were providing them. Next slide, please, Joe. So then again, this framework of payments, not only giving people the option to use PayPoint for receiving money straight to their phone, um, we also put in place um, payment cards, which are a little bit like a debit card, but without that ability to go into an overdraft um, and take out debt. Putting that in place has probably moved about a quarter of our clients away and made them feel more in control of their their money and their finances. Um, again, look, this really led into actually how do we manage corporate appointees as a whole? How often are the reviews taking place? Are we helping people back to financial independence or are we putting them on a corporate appointeeship and leaving them there for long periods of time with a almost tick box review? So that process is now changed. Um, social workers are having to justify the and ensure that they've had a conversation with people around how they are going to receive their money. So instead of the default being come collect your money from us, because at the end of the day, this is still our client's money that we are managing on their behalf. It's not our money that we are then handing out to them. So making sure those conversations happen at that point of assessment and review to make sure that clients are involved in their care because the management of their money is just another aspect of their care so it should be treated in the same way we have things in place for someone's um, physical care such as sds but that wasn't mirrored in our 
financial processes and our issuing of cash. So giving someone that almost that autonomy to use different methods where they were able and felt that was the best approach for them was really important. And again, having those more modern payment vehicles in there for some of our clients, like the basic cards I just mentioned, meant people were able to go and use contactless in a shop just like their peers. So that was really important. Next slide, Joe. Finally, moving on, our through care aftercare people, so those 16 to 18 year olds, they had systems in place to play to pay clients digitally, which was a little bit of a surprise to us, but they there was a long wait from them moving into the through care aftercare service. It would be about eight weeks before somebody was set up with a bank card. So being able to give them a payment card straight off the bat to go, this is how you're going to be receiving your money. But also the issue was lying further upstream in the fact that our, our clients were going through our care system and had never been given access to anything other than cold hard cash before. And then 2021 at the time we were we were undertaking this work that really wasn't that didn't feel right to me or any of our clients really that someone can get to 16 and has never had access to a bank card just because they've been in the care system so we've looked upstream to go how can we provide things like um like go henry that kind of thing in our residential houses so that instead of giving our our younger kids cash we're giving them that experience of using a card and being able to manage their own money next slide please joe so like i've just said having those conversations around money at an earlier stage what we were finding is the um the local authority benefit that our through care after care kids get is significantly higher than universal credit so we were finding that from 16 to 18 uh, our clients were living almost a life of luxury with no need to budget and never having had experience of that. It wasn't really seen as a necessary skill. And then moving on to universal credit or into paid employment, hopefully after 18, really finding that they were struggling to manage their money because they've never been given those skills. So looking back upstream at our schools, we're now bringing in qualifications around money management and making sure that those those kids are actually being given those skills from a young age and linking into the promise, making sure that we're not actually failing some of our most vulnerable clients. Next slide, please, Joe. So that really sums up all the work we've kind of been doing. We've been taking that real approach of listening to our users and then building it in. Um, one of the questions that's just came in there is, is Go, Go Henry charged? It absolutely is charged council. It was about building that business case, similarly to Paypoint and our cards, that actually us investing in our clients and giving them those ability will mean ultimately we have less clients to manage and also they will be more empowered to look after themselves. So it, it was about building it into our kind of options analysis and baking our user needs into the options to go, how well will these options meet that user need that we've identified? So a little bit of a different approach there in saying, these are all the things we can do. How well does it meet our needs? Not how much does it cost? How well does it meet the need? So thank you very much for listening.